<laughs> cessationist is someone who believes that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased from today. Like they're no longer for us. They have stopped with the apostles. I grew up with this and I see the nonsense that's out there, but I still think it is for today. It's very arrogant for someone to say that it, they have ceased as if they have ultimate knowledge. As you're saying that no culture in the world at this moment needs the gifts of the spirit. I'm Chuck Tate, and here at Fellowship of Believers, we encourage families, strengthen marriages, and edify the body of Christ. I'm Larry Grimm. We also promote biblical doctrine in a fun and engaging way. And I'm Sarah. And if it's Christian, we're talking about it. This is the Mike Charleston Show. <laughs> All right, what is up? Yeah, thank you, Joshua. And uh, so everyone is here, Larry and Chuck and Sarah and me are here. How you doing, Mike? And I'm doing well. Yeah. How are you? You tired? Well, yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> we had a baby shower last night. That's right. And uh, I think that was my first baby shower I've been to. Mine too. Yeah. <laughs> this is the That's, new age yeah. where... It was fun. It was all right. It was fun. It was great. Next thing you know, you'll be going to a bridal shower. I did. I, I had my own. It was a couple's. That was a wedding shower. That's right. Anyway. Uh, anyway, wrong. all these things we have to interpret. But anyways, uh, speaking of interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. So Good segue there. You saw what I did. Huh? I worked hard at that one. So today we are going to be talking about speaking in tongues. And uh, this one, we, we had a number of people... Like, want us to talk about this. And I thought, well, should we just speak in tongues and then have someone interpret it? Or, <laughs> so, no, they wanted us to talk about the, the gift of tongues, uh, the Holy Spirit, something like that. And I thought, okay, now's the time. We're going to do this. And uh, so, why are we doing this? Does it really matter? I think so. Yeah. I think it because you look around. What is the fastest growing churches in America are m mainly charismatic and Pentecostal in nature, right? Right. And so this came from what was it? ChristianPost dot com. Um, whatever. It's just a, a quote. Why don't you go ahead, babe? Read this quote. It says about a quarter of America. That's twenty five percent. Okay, about One a quarter fourth. of American evangelicals say they have spoken in tongues at some point in their life, even though a majority don't identify as either Pentecostal or charismatic Christians. Okay, so that doesn't even make sense to me to begin with. Yeah, right. it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so 25% of evangelicals, so not Protestants, I guess, so evangelicals. Um, well, yeah, maybe they're making a distinction with the Protestants as being the mainline churches like... Catholic, uh, well, no, not Catholic wouldn't be Protestant. That's but. true. <laughs> <laughs> they, they protested the Catholic. So like the Lutheran, Methodist, the, Luther, yeah. Right. Um, okay, they're they're separate. But the Evangelical Church, out uh, of the ev Evangelical Church, a quarter of them say they have spoken in tongues at some point, but wouldn't yeah. consider themselves charismatic or Pentecostal. That. Really doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but, you know, whatever. I, I guess Sarah was saying, well, what about like us? So, like Sarah and I had grew up in charismatic churches, and we have spoken in tongues, and at, at some point in our lives. But she has said, would we have considered myself charismatic or Pentecostal today? And I said, yes, I, I think I would still consider myself a charismatic because I do believe in the gifts are for today. Whether I do them or not is irrelevant. But so I think I would. I don't know. Would you? I know you two don't. <laughs> no. I, would, I would ask you. I'm not sure. Oh, like, I don't know sure. how to classify myself. Okay, so but this is a this is a legitimate Based topic. Based on your definition, I would. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> but, but, uh, see, oh, that's yeah. a, I don't know that I would define it that way. <laughs> yeah, because it's you, fair. You either they, that's the problem with categorizing things, and I know pe we do that all the time. But it's either you're a charismatic or you're a cessationist. There's no, like there's well, there's there is a middle ground, right? There's really nothing left for nuance or anything. Right. It's, it's just like with the Calvinism. You're either a Calvinist or you're an Arminius. Right. I'm like, well, that's not true. There's not two choices. I don't live near Russia. Right. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm that's not right. You're not an Armenian. <laughs> well, but I think it's actually really important to talk about, which, like, I was talking to the kids about it, and I would like to just. Like, it doesn't matter. I don't think it's a salvation issue whether or not somebody speaks in tongues. And so I'm just like, you know what? I don't anymore. Some, some people do. And so, great. You do you, I'll do me. Like, that kind of thing. 
But my problem is that when you look at scripture, there's a lot in the Bible about tongues. Yeah. And it's not just something from way back then, today. A lot of people speak in tongues, a lot of people don't. And so I feel like, can we look at something that is in the Bible a whole lot and just say, I don't know and I don't really care. I don't really have a, uh, no, I an don't opinion think that would be good. It. Right. Oh, I, I think that's a fair point that it's in the Bible. So we do have to take it seriously. You know, right. It's an issue and we, we need to tackle the issue. Now, at the end of it, we may not have changed our mind at all. Now, Sarah and I have a very unique perspective. Now, Chuck and Larry grew up not speaking in tongues or going a part of it. They weren't part of a uh, charismatic church. Never right, even you know. tried. Not no. even tried, <laughs> you know, not even went to a lady and said, repeat after me, huh? <laughs> so, so we have had varying degrees of, and this is why I didn't want to do this is because uh, I grew up with this and, and I'm not really a part of it anymore, but I still sympathize with it a, a little bit, but not completely, if that, that makes sense. I, I see the nonsense that's out there, but I still think it is for today. And I really don't know how I feel on it. And I do now, I mean, after a couple of weeks of studying this and, and getting into this, um, I made it a point to, okay, what do I really think about it? And the more that I get into it, the more nonsense that I see out there. It's just, it's, it's just garbage stuff. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist for today. So I guess that's the next question, are tongues for today? So before we go any further, and I think I know the answer to this question, you know, a cessationist. So a cessationist is not someone who is into cessationalism, right. but a cessationist <laughs> is someone who believes that the gifts have ceased, the, the gifts of the Spirit have ceased from uh, for today, like they're no longer for for us. They have stopped with the apostles, right? right. Larry would yeah. know it because he's closest to that category. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. That is correct. Yeah, that is the definition that the gifts ceased when the apostles died. Some people put it at a little bit after the apostles' sure. death. The transition. Right, yeah, the right. transition. The transition. <laughs> but uh, now I would fall in that category to some degree, but sure. not hundred percent. Okay, not on a scale of one to a hundred. <laughs> yes, right. I'd probably be about ninety. Okay, yeah, oh, so I mean, that's what I thought. You know, yeah. I thought Larry is. is so, he's, wow. We've talked about this before. I think he's really close to be a cessationist, and that's fine. Uh, Chuck, where are you on the spectrum? Uh, no, I actually would not be consider myself a cessationist. Right. I would uh, believe that the uh, the gifts are still valid for today. Although, as I told you a while ago, as far as speaking in tongues goes, I've I myself grew up in Southern Baptist Church. There was nobody who spoke in tongues. No, or, I'm sure not. Uh, not at all. Um, I've never I've, I've never spoken in tongues. I've never um, heard anybody speak in tongues. Wow, See, that's the uh, shocker. I have known wow. people who say they spoke in tongues, but right. I, I definitely believe that it's still a possibility that. God could use that today if he wanted to. Yeah, I actually think it's a very arrogant... No no offense, uh, Larry. But <laughs> I, I think it's very arrogant for someone to I say... I could say that. <laughs> it's very arrogant. No offense, Larry. <laughs> well, he's not 100%. So, but I do personally think it's, it's, a, it's very arrogant for someone to say that it, they have ceased as if they have ultimate knowledge. And I think maybe that's why Larry's at the 90% because oh. he's probably like, well, there could be... Somewhere out there that maybe it could be legitimate use for. Right. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to speak for you, but I, I, because I, I think what really the cause of this, so the cessationists will say that, and there's a whole new movie out there about this. I'm sure the Calvinists came up with it. And uh, the cessationists, you know, are, are pushing hard. And because they feel like they have the biblical argument, whereas the, the tongues talkers and the gifts of the spirit people just are more emotional driven. And that's a, that's a, that's a very big, um, uh, broad brush to, to to paint with, right? It, it's I don't think it's that simple, but the cessationists will uh, say that they 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 died away with the apostles or or soon after, and no longer for today. Now we're talking about tongues. We're talking about interpretation, obviously, uh, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. 
uh, works he- of miracles, healing, healing, those things have all ceased. And that's where I have a problem. I'm like, well, to have the like a word of knowledge, do you understand what a word of knowledge is? I mean, it's I know what some people think <laughs> they have a word of knowledge, but uh, there can legitimately be words of knowledge or prophecy. Um, could there be a, someone that prophesies something? Um, sure, to the extent that we're seeing it today in Bethel, and uh, you know, I don't think so. But could could there be? And to, so, for me to think that someone says that they're a cessationist, you know, hundred percent, not ninety percent, hundred percent. To me, that's a very arrogant statement because you're saying that no culture in the world at this moment needs the gifts of the spirit. You could say, well, in America, we just don't see them. They're all fake. And all. okay, maybe, maybe, maybe whatever. But you're saying in Uganda or Sudan, it's not needed at all. Or you know that there's not a legitimate use of it being done somewhere in the world today. Uh, that would just be hard pressed for me. And it's so much in the Bible. And, 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 and we've listened to a few people that are cessationists. And I think the only verse that they come up with it's First Corinthians thirteen eight. Yeah, which says, "Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail; whether there be tongues, they shall cease; whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away." So yeah, so that's kind of where they would say, "See, it says yeah. those so they shall cease when the when the perfect comes." Right? You you didn't read the whole verse right there, but you can go back uh, toward the end of uh, chapter thirteen there, and but if you keep reading. It just doesn't make sense that all that has ceased, you know, like knowledge has ceased. Uh, whether it be knowledge itself vanished away, or is knowledge gone? Uh, well, they might say a word of knowledge, oh, which well, well, is different than knowledge. Right. But. Mm, maybe, well, the, maybe. the problem with that thinking, that, and I'm going to be on the defense of That's cessationists, fine. but it's what is superior? Is it your experience of your word of knowledge or your right. whatever, mm-hmm. your gift? Or is the scripture superior? Right. Well, okay. So no. Here's the here's the pro- this is, here's where the rub is, is that I could see why a lot of people. So cessationism really didn't come about until lately, right? Because it's, there wasn't really a need for it. The tongues wasn't that big of an issue until the turn of the nineteenth century. I know there has been little pockets here and there, right, yeah. but not until Azusa Street did it yeah. become really a big thing in the church. And so cessationism didn't need to make an argument. You know, they just were like, well, was, uh, there's yeah. no tongues. <laughs> right. Right. Well, <laughs> so that what they saw then was an abuse of what they saw, what they thought was an abuse of the gifts of the Spirit. And like, no, this isn't what it looks like. And so then they started making an argument. Now, I could still make that argument too and be like, well, what I see... Right. It's kind it's of an like abuse, a, right. too, and it's just nonsense. I see a lot of garbage out there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's all wrong, you know? So that's where I don't want... I don't want to go that far. Just like if I see people doing marriage wrong, doesn't mean we just throw out marriage. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. You know, so right. it's like, well, there are still people who are doing marriage well, <laughs> so... Yeah. Just because people are getting divorced and breaking up doesn't mean that marriage is now all of a sudden bad. Maybe that's a bad example. It ceased. Right, it ceased. It ceased. <laughs> but it, they're, I get why, you know, they would say, well, it, it went away, and why did it come back? And, and there's other arguments, and uh, I get it. But biblically speaking, there's not that many arguments for it because there's a lot of Unless you want to use the transition argument, right, right, right. Uh, you know, right. Transition. But there's, there's, this is, seems <laughs> to be the only one. Now, to be <clears> fair, <throat> I don't know all the cessation arguments, but they, this is the big that, one. That's the biggest verse, yeah. Right. And but I will say, like you mentioned, like Uganda or something. But if you look at places like that in Africa, what is spreading? It's not sound biblical teaching or doctrine. It's all these sign signs or wonders. Yeah. yeah, and so there's really not a lot of Bible teaching Bible doctrine. It's everybody's having these experiences and, and that's, that, that couldn't be the legitimate Holy Spirit moving. Well when you got a preacher that claims to heal people by well, farting yeah. on them. That, well, well, yeah, and so, so that's where you have some nonsense. There, there's right, a lot yeah. of nonsense out there. And and that's the danger is when you check your 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 mind at the door and there's no discernment. Like right. I still think that there are Bible believing 
quote unquote spirit filled, you know, uh, tongue talkers or whatever that still have discernment. You know, I, yeah. I, I work with a few. I, I yeah. think uh, I've known a few in my day. I'd like to think that I was one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in, in the day, but it was, um, the, I think there was still discernment. And like I was telling others that when I was growing up in our particular church, uh, charismatic church or Pentecostal church or whatever it was, the we still rejected a few of the the nonsense people out there. It's like, well, just because they did things that we did didn't mean we accepted them as right. sound biblical doctrine. So the Kenneth Hagans and the Kenneth <laughs> Copelands of the world, they were a little too much for us. You know, wow. even though we were in that same <laughs> world. So it's not like we checked our minds at the door. We still wanted to do things biblically. So I want to give people the benefit of the doubt and like, okay, there are some people that want to do these things the biblical way. I, I, yeah, to. and I'll say I, where I come from is I don't think God, I don't want to put him in a box and say he can't do right, these things, right. that it stopped and that's it. But like you said, where's the legitimate use for it? You don't see that. I have never experienced it. I don't know anybody who has, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Right, right. Just because I haven't experienced or right. seen it. And that's fair. Right. So, in places where people are not as educated, having somebody come and perform a miracle or something might be a case where they will turn to God. Right. But if the problem is, and just we see this biblically, what do the Israelites do? with the serpent that God had Moses make and put up on a pole for healing. It became an idol, and they started worshiping it. And sure. So that's the problem with these miracles, these signs. People start worshiping that and seeking after those things, and that is a problem because then now, well, we don't need the Scripture. I had a cousin who was, he went around teaching. He called it preaching, but he was in a holiness Pentecostal church. Sure. He couldn't read <laughs> past the fifth grade. And so he had no knowledge of Bible doctrine or how to study the Bible, but yet he's out there preaching. And all it was was just emotional um, pleas mm -hmm. and nonsense, but yet he was out there preaching. And right. So I'm like, you, and he even told me, he goes, I don't need the Bible, I have the Holy Spirit. See, that's where the, the, that, that is where the danger comes in, right. is where we put too much emphasis. It's like some people put so much emphasis on just, we have the Word of God, that's all we need. And then some people are like, we have the Holy Ghost. So that that's that's living, that's active. It's not the deadness of the right. letter of the law, yeah. you know. And But we need both. Right. I think it's both. We, we need the Word of God and we need the Spirit of God living in us. And so I think it takes both. And, and, and we get so caught up in our in our positions that we want to say, I'm totally over here, or I'm totally over here, and we yeah. neglect the, the other thing. And I think that is a big, big danger. Um, well, I think before we go any further, I think we need to define our terms. And what what do you mean by tongues? What is it? Sarah was right. She, was that? she knew you were going right yeah. there. So, yes. <laughs> that's, that's, well, because that's important, because if you look at the history, I'm going to jump ahead of myself, but our modern concept of tongues, where it comes from, you mentioned Azusa Street, but it actually comes before him with Parham. Parham had a kind of, what I'd say, correct view of script of tongues because he thought it was you would get an, the gift of a known, known sure. language. They even sent out missionaries, and it didn't work too well. <laughs> now, that would be Charles Parham. Yeah, and, and, but yes. then after that, they changed, and his student, uh, what was Agnes. her name? Well, his, yeah, his, she got the gift of tongues and yeah. even had the ability to write in Chinese. Did she really? Yes, yeah, she did. And, and they even have pictures of her. Was writings. it real Chinese? No. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> no, not even close. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> that is terrible. Right. So, uh, what's his name? Seymour. Seymour. And Azusa Street. They realized that he saw the failure. And real and thought, well, it, obviously it's got to mean something else. Right. Tongues has to mean something else. And that's where we get our... Well, here's where my problem with tongues is. And so we've covered the fact that we, I think, at least Chuck, I, and Sarah over here, we, we're definitely on the camp where 
we believe that the, the, the gifts of the Spirit are for today. What they look like is debatable, I think, right? Is that what you would say? Yeah, I would it, say so. We're, yeah. Okay. Larry's a little bit more on the camp of cessationism, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's fine. But here's my problem with tongues is that, okay, we're going, we're going to cover some of the scriptures here. And I see it, and I experienced this. So I grew up in a church that, that we, we did this weekly. I mean, it was a couple times a week, you know, every service. We we prayed for people. I was a part of this for, for 18, 19 years. So I, I know what I'm talking about. And um, in the process, though, I started thinking, as I'm studying within, you know, the Bible college that was Pentecostal, you know, it was a Sons of God. And in that Bible college, I'm stu- studying these things, and they're not very consistent. And I questioned them. They didn't have any answers for me. And that's not why I left. But, you know, it's it's some of the things that, that bugged me was that, okay, so speaking in tongues, what we know of speaking in tongues comes basically from Azusa Street. Right. Well, how do we know they were right? You know, so no one's ever challenged them. They just accept it that this what this is what tongues is, or could have just been an emotional experience. Could have been something else. Maybe it was tongues. I'm not saying it wasn't, but I'm just saying we've never challenged what tongues is. So now that we have these services and expectations of what it'll be like, mm-hmm. and that gets passed on very quickly and virally, basically. And we know what to expect, and we get people traveling around, and to the point where I've had people try to teach me how to speak in tongues. <laughs> people would pray over me for hours to, to get to speak in tongues until finally I did, you know. And I'd like to think that I really did, you know. I was sincere. You were sincere. I was, and I did it for many years. And um, so, anyway, that that's that's my problem. Is it what with when we define tongues? It's like, well, what is it? I want it to be the real deal. I want it to be of God. I don't want it to be of myself or worse, <laughs> of something else. Right. You know, so I don't want it to be counterfeit. So when we say, what is the gift of tongues? So, okay, so so I've been listening to a number of people. Your basic, and we don't want to get to all the, the weirdness out there, because oh, there is some, a bunch of weirdness. Yeah. <laughs> but you have the basic one of just the gift of tongues is one, is like the the sign gift uh, in Acts where when they when the day of Pentecost was come. Right. And they were all in one accord, and Acts 2, 1 through 4, you might as well read it since we're, we're okay. right here. Um, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And, and by the way, if you're a Pentecostal, you know this verse by heart. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> okay. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, so they were filled with the Holy Ghost, which will come in handy Next week, uh, you'll see yeah, in just a second. Yeah. But they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, so the Spirit gave them utterance, and they all spoke in tongues. Um, we'll say all of them. You know, they, they all spoke in tongues. And it was something that they all heard in their own languages as you read on. And so our first understanding of this is that it was actually a known language. Yeah. So it was a gift that God poured out right. for... For, for what, I don't know, just that, that the Word of God would be proclaimed right. in many languages. The day of Pentecost, a lot of people, a lot of different cultures yeah. came here to to celebrate, and it was a good time for a lot of different cultures here, a lot of different languages, and they're speaking, and they're speaking in a language that they don't know and other people can hear. Right. So that's like one thing. When I say that's the sign gift right. that the Holy Ghost was given. Then other people say the gift of tongues, like for in First Corinthians twelve, where there's diverse, or First Corinthians fourteen, or whatever it is, the uh, that there's um, uh, like for church. So when you get up there and you speak in tongues, it needs to be interpreted. So they would say that's a different kind of tongue. Which in verse First uh, Corinthians twelve eight through ten. Uh, just read the part where it says, verse 10, right, babe? Okay, it says, To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of so tongues. So they'll say the diverse kinds of tongues, which is many, 
many different kinds right. of tongues. So there's different kinds of tongues. They'll say, see, uh, you're limited to one kind of tongue. There's more than one kinds of tongues. I'm like, okay, I get what you're saying. So there's a prayer language, you, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, which is number awesome. three, which is a, another one that people will come up with as a prayer language. Now, prayer language, I have, I have been in Pentecost for many, many years. I grew up in it. I was taught it. Trust me when I tell you this. Growing up in the Assemblies of God that I did, they they taught this like every other week. It was yeah. like we had a revival all the time and come down if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues and other tongues and you know any anyway. This is a very foundational point for them. And they never ever gave any Bible or anything on prayer language. It yeah. just was. You know why? Because it's not in there. <laughs> it's, not there. Right. It's, it's, it's not there. <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> There's a reason why. But uh, but they'll say this is diff- different kinds of tongues. But um, so anyway, so that you know, so Chuck, you grew up a Southern Baptist. So when uh-huh. when we say how would you de- describe tongues, you know, as a person growing up in a in a Baptist church, so. The way I would do it is basically two forms. One okay. would be uh, speaking in another language that someone understands. Sure. All right. So I'm, and it could be either trained in that language. Okay. Okay. You know, I could take the idea of the gift of tongues being that it's easy for somebody to learn multiple languages. That, so more of the Mormon take, not to compare uh, yeah, right, you to right, right, right. That, <laughs> right no, yeah. The uh, the other being just a supernatural um, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where I'm talking. In one language, and somebody else is hearing in another. Okay, um, which is what you see at the day yeah. of Pentecost. Right. The only the only example that I have of that that and it's not a personal example, but I remember reading from um, uh, the book Bruch Co. You know, yeah. Bruce Olson, where he was talking to the Bari people, and he actually led these Bari and to come to know Christ, and they had a burden for another tribe. A tribe that actually wanted to kill them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But they decided they were going to go take the gospel to this other tribe. And he was like, he didn't want to stop them from doing that, but it's like they got no way of understanding. They don't speak the same language. Yeah. And they went and they shared with these other people, and the other people understood and got saved, and they came back rejoicing. Yeah. So when you hear stories like that, you either got to say, that's a lie, or could that have been the Spirit of God doing something that yeah. we don't understand. Yeah, right. right. And could that have been a, a miracle, you know, where someone is speaking and they have no, they don't know how to speak their language, but they can, it, it, now they can understand. Yeah. And so that's where we don't want to limit God. And right, I think exactly. that's why you're on that 90%. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so you're like, I don't want to go that far, but it could be that something like that. Right, exactly. And that, uh, to me, I think that's a proper use of the gift of tongues. Where, Because what is the purpose when it was given in Acts? The purpose was to get the message out. Because Jesus, the last thing he said to him in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, after that, you shall receive the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power. Or you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right. Judea, Samaria. So it was. they were starting there because they were in Jerusalem. And then they were supposed to go out from there. And when they got the Holy Spirit, they had the ability, the gift of tongues. Right. So that message got out quickly to a lot of people in a short amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, now, an, ex- a, an objection to that maybe, and I may be jumping ahead of myself, was Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius, because there's no reference to him going out and preaching. But I think the point of that is, if you read the whole chapter, it's God telling Peter, look, I'm not going to just the Jews. Right, Gentiles. I'm going to the Gentiles. Right. And so when Peter went to Cornelius and preached, they got the same gift. Right. The same Holy Spirit, the same gift. That's what of they tongues. said. They're like, right. hey, they 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 had the same experience basically. Right. How can we forbid them? Right. You know, so and, it was God showing Peter, hey, it, this is not just a Jewish thing. It's going to be for the whole world. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's the 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 difference in why Cornelius didn't really go out and preach right after that. But it was just right. Like, and we don't know what happened right, right after we don't, that. We, right? don't, we don't know. But it's not part of the story. And maybe he did. Maybe he uh, didn't. Yeah, perhaps. But I we doubt he sat down and watched the football game <laughs> right. after that. But, you know. It's... But it was just the point was for God to show Peter that this is more than just the Jews. It's yes. the Gentiles as well. And right after that, I should say right after that, but not long after that, Paul came on the scene. And Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, and, specifically this episode, we're just specifically talking about 
more of the gifts of the Spirit right. and tongues. Because I think the definition between like the Holy Spirit's work, um, because even cessationists will still believe the Holy Spirit is at work. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But we don't know how, but they believe that, but okay. No, no. maybe we can <laughs> ask one. No. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, they would still say that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives today. Now, the, the charismatic can't fathom that, you know, where if they're not speaking in tongues, which right. is, a, is which is a fault. We'll talk about that in the next episode, because this is going to be a two-parter, people. And in the next episode, we'll talk about some of those differences where they, they you know, why people want to speak in tongues and why they don't, you know. Now, but I'm going to go back to my first question about how would you define tongues? So how would you define it? Well, and, like Chuck was saying, so uh, I'll repeat what what Chuck says. You know, <laughs> you know. But well, also, because you just I mean, you didn't really define it, so I just want to make sure people listening well, could say, okay, yeah. this is honey. Okay, well, so did you want to define it? Well, I was just curious to see what you thought. I okay, just... so I think so. Speaking in tongues, like like Chuck was saying, that I I believe personally that it is a a known language, and we can talk about that and why we think that it's a known language on the face of the earth that someone can interpret um, for the edification of other people. Now the is it a, a, a spirit thing? It's not something that I need to conjure up, that I need to have a, um, a faith for either. Right. These were things, these, these things are God just poured out and yeah. it was on them. They didn't ask for it. No, they, you yeah, know, they, you go they, to many ch- charismatic churches, you have to work hard for this. You have to ask for it. You have to be prayer for it. You have to let, seek it. It takes yeah. weeks, maybe. Have uh, hands laid on you. Yeah. And they say it's all over you. Yeah. Just speak it. Just whatever that comes to your mind. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is stupid. Do you want me to say that? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, um, <laughs> you know, but well, it's, it's, it's something, you know, I've gone through the whole gamut and, what we do, all the shenanigans that we do to get people filled with the Holy Ghost did not happen in the Bible. No. <laughs> they got it. They got it because God poured it out. Right. And if you read, if you do a search on tongues in the Bible, you'll find that it is a known language. language. Right. Well, that's what the word actually means. Right. So if, you know, which is kind of surprising <laughs> that, you know, these modern languages, modern Bible versions, they like to change things. But if you look up what tongues means, it just basic at the basic level means language. Mm-hmm. It's either referring to a language or, or the actual physical tongue. tongue. Yeah, yeah physical, right. Yeah. Like James, you know. Yeah, right. But it's it's. Um, but these modern versions they don't change that word glossia. Right. Why? Because it's become a thing. Yeah. It becomes a, a thing in and of itself. Tongues. We know what tongues is now in the church. And so it's like, well, we can't change that and say, well, it means language, you know, right, yeah, because because it would mess up everything. Well, especially so now, since it's a growing movement and any church that's growing, they get money. So we have a question so. here, like known language. <laughs> right. So 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 2, what does that say, babe? For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Okay, so this is the challenge of people saying, what do you mean it's a, a known language? Right. You're speaking mysteries so this is the prayer language verse. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. This is where we get, uh, you're speaking mysteries to God and not speaking to men. And this is the whole argument that Paul would say, you're being selfish, you're not yeah. edifying the body. <laughs> it's not like a positive thing to edify, the, mm-hmm. you know, you edify yourself. You're basically coming to church to edify yourself. That's never a good thing. No. <laughs> so you are, uh, you, you're, you're, you should come edifying others. Um, but so, yeah, when you speak to in an unknown tongue, speak not unto men, but unto God. Because if it's an unknown tongue, that means I don't know what I'm saying. You don't know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So it's only speaking mysteries to God. And so that's what they'll see. That's a, that's a prayer language. That's right. a good thing. That is not a good thing. That was a rebuke. Right. right. So he's like, you're, you're be, you, the, the spirit, he speak of mysteries. Um, so that's the, the ar- argument against a known language, right? That this was, but this would be an uh, argument for a known language, uh, against a known right. language. Yeah. Right. Because it does sound like they're not speaking to men. So it's not like I'm speaking in the tongue, but some people out there are going to understand me. This is, sounds different. Yeah. Because I guess we forgot to go back. I, I'm, so it's either a known language on the face of the earth, which I believe, and I think most of us on in here believe that, um, or it's it's a heavenly language, which means it's 
it's not on this earth, right. so it's just Something whatever. Nobody here understands. Yeah, and right. I, w- I would want to know what Shunda means in heaven because I hear that a lot. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so <laughs> I'd want to know what heaven Well, that, that and means. if you say it's a heavenly language, okay, let's go with that. How do you know? Like, if I hear Chinese, I can recognize it that, oh, that's Chinese. I don't understand what they're saying at all. And now, if I hear Chinese, Korean, <laughs> Vietnam, you know, Vietnamese together, I might not be able to distinguish which one's which, but I can have an idea. Say it's the Far East. But, right. But and, you don't know, but they would say that it's by faith because, I mean, I don't know, but I was praying and all of a sudden I started speaking in this whatever, these syllables started coming out. And so I believe God gave me this gift. See, the the problem, and this is going to open another can of worms, but the <laughs> when you do that, how do you say, okay, like... Uh, what do they call it? Um, spirit writing or free writing, whatever. Have you ever heard of that? No, no. What's no, well, really in the occult of, where you you just start writing uh, things? Oh and, yeah, like the Ouija board or something, basically. Something like it's, that. Yeah. It's like you just okay. So if you say, well, you know, I was just something came over me and I just started writing. Well, was it the spirit? What spirit was it? Right. And that's and when you start speaking something that's unintelligible and you say, well, it's just I'm just letting free speech. I'm just letting it come out. Well, how do you know what spirit it is? Well, you got to test the spirits, right. but then no one has a good but test. But you can't test. Uh, if you want to find tests, we, we have searched all week long, and it is ridiculous the number of <laughs> things that people test on how they think this is like, just for example, one guy said, this is how you know if it's truly of God, if you can speak in tongues and text at the same time. <laughs> because your mind isn't engaged, your spirit is speaking, but you can, with your mind, be texting, and you can still... I'm like, that's a stupid test. That is, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> dude, but that's a stupid test. That is ridiculous. You know how many other things I could do? I watched a video where a guy was drawing pictures of faces, four different pa- faces. He had a, a board with his feet, and then both pins in each hand, and he's drawing Good four night. different faces at the same time. With his feet and his hands. With the spirit? I, yeah, so that's, <laughs> it's like, well, if that was a test, you know, then... Well, the, but the interesting thing to me about the the idea of a uh, an un, uh, a, a, a tongue that nobody can understand, you know, mm-hmm. this this heavenly language is what purpose is it serving right. anybody here? That it, it, The only purpose it could possibly serve is between you and God. Right. So if, if you truly believe it, Go do it in a closet somewhere between you and God. I have sure. no; it, it's not helping me at all. Right, right. So why why would I be doing it in public in front of a lot of people unless you I'm try and draw attention? Well, to because myself. maybe you don't know that. Like how do, how would you know if you speak in tongues? Like maybe this is a time somebody's here. There's a, a bigger gathering, and so I'm not sure if maybe somebody here needs to hear the gospel or the. the Something proclaimed of God in their own language, like I wouldn't know. But so. there still needs to be an interpreter for us, the people who, who may not be that guy. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I right. Mean, yeah. Well, like we experienced this on a small scale when we went, to, friends of ours uh, had a housewarming party and they're Indian, like India Indian, and they uh, speak Hindi and other things. And uh, what was, the, how did they pronounce it? Um, uh, anyways, it was, it's a weird language. Um, and they brought some friends that all speak Hindi and Matababa or whatever. That <laughs> sounded like tongues there. But the um, while we were sitting there, there was one guy who we get up and speak, and they had it interpreted. And I could almost barely hear the interpretation because they were just, Amen, yeah, yeah. good Lord, yeah. Well, and I'm like, oh, I can't even hear what the English part is. But it must have been good. But then there was another guy that got spoken, and no one was interpreting that. And he's just he's just going off, and I'm like I have no idea what is going on. Right, and they could all be speaking in tongues for all I know, yeah. you know. And no one was interpreting, and uh, found out later because there wasn't anybody there that that could interpret. Everyone understood, but to interpret into English, it was just too difficult. Right, yeah. so no one did. And then I'm like, you know what? We were the minority. Right. So right, right. I, I didn't care. You know, we were like the, the two English people there. So <laughs> uh, it, it was not a big deal. But the, everyone else was being edified and it seemed like it was good, but I have no idea what's going on. So imagine going to a church, which, by the way, was what was going on in Corinth, where people were just 
speak it in different languages, right. speak it in different, you know, whatever. And no one was being edified because it's like, okay, we're just showing off how spiritual we are, right. our so-called spirituality here. But there's no love in it. And that's where he's writing all these things that if you love when you put them first, you want to benefit them. You want to edify yeah. them. So whatever gift that was, which ironically, tongues was the one that they were abusing. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and he said, seek the desire the best gift, whatever gift is needed, not just the one that right. you think is the best, yeah. whatever one is actually needed. So I think that is an important thing. The, the other problem I have with this, the I don't even want to call it tongues. I call it ecstatic utterances because... If you look at the history where it comes from, it's not good. No, right. And it's not biblical. I mean, if you listen to the history time with Larry, you might get a, That's right. a little plug a little there. Little but. That's right. That's <laughs> but, coming up next. I yeah. mean, I think it kind of comes from Acts, and that was good. Well, that they was good. They were waiting good. for the promise of the Father. Well, and... yeah, but I don't think that, I think that's a different definition of tongues than mm-hmm. what we see today, especially what we see today. And you see, like, Bethel, or, or even... Um, Oh, what's his name? Robert Tilton. Oh man, I don't. Is he still around? I don't, I know, don't know. But yes. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's right. like who's going to get saved listening to that? To right. me, if I'm not a Christian, yeah, I am a Christian, and I see that. I'm like, that is completely ridiculous. And so, yeah, it's like, well, that's not helping anybody. That's I don't see anybody getting saved from that. But that's. All right, so my also, interpretation. Right, there you go. <laughs> the other known language that you know, in Acts with Cornelius, we kind of talked about this already. Cornelius, not everybody there was necessarily speaking a known language. Uh, let's see, tongues aren't always interpreted in Scripture. Is is uh, so? You know, what example did we have that tongues weren't interpreted? Well, like somebody said, "Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed?" And they I said, don't even know there was we one. We didn't even know. Right. And so they received oh, yeah. the Holy Ghost, and there was no interpreter, but it says they spoke in tongues. Right. But did so. they, was it a known language? It seems like that if they could have understood. Right. Right. Well, see, this is where, <clears throat> and this is where I come from. I say, let's start with what we know right. and then move out from there. It's sort of like I used to do service work. And when there was a problem, I always started with the simplest thing. Is it plugged is in? It pl- yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? So, what? Where is the first mention of tongues in the Bible? What does it say about it, and what is it? Well, the first mention of tongues is in Genesis, right? Okay, and it's it's a known language, right? It's, that was so, the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Uh, actually, no, it's um, Genesis ten. I had yeah, it up Genesis here. Genesis ten. Okay, but before anyway, the Tower of Babel, it, after, but after the Tower of Babel, right. yeah. How, they all that? divided by their tongues. Right, yeah, by their tongue. Yeah, it was a, so. Arr. Yeah, <laughs> or start doing the clicking language of the like. Well, that's the like I can roll my R. Sarah can't. She no. cannot. Try. Come on. Hey, I can't do it. Try. Try. <laughs> can't do it. Doesn't can't work. Do it. Yeah. But so you start with what you know and what is simple, and then you move out from there. So we know. Okay, if you go with a rule of first mention, a word in the Bible, how is it defined the first time it's used? Then you get an idea of what it's going to be talking about. What's, you I don't... mean, which is fine, but I think on the other side, they would say you miss out on a lot because you just want to stick to what we know, and it's like God. Well, that's just a where lot he said where we start. Us. That's where we start. That's fine, but how how long are you going to stay there? Well, <laughs> but the, from the start, then you say, okay, well, when, by the time you get to Acts, okay, what is tongues? Well, we already know from previous verses how it was used, so from that we can say, okay, this is how it was used in Acts chapter two. Then we get to Acts chapter ten. How was it? And then, and so forth, so that we have a history of how it was used in all the other verses in the Bible, and now all of a sudden we get to Acts, and it's something completely different, something unheard of. Sure, that doesn't well, seem I mean, to cloven fit. Cloven tongues of fire were kind of different. Well, well, yeah, I'll give you that. But was cloven <laughs> tongues of fire? Tongues, tongues, or was that something different? Well, it was the physical tongue. Right. right. That, yeah. was just a, that was a sign yeah, yeah. Right. that kind of showed what was going on. And um, But anyway, the, the, the tongue itself was heard, understood, and like, hey, I can right. hear them in my language. Yeah. Right. And so people would say, but yeah, but that was just, that's different than the gift of tongues that needs to be interpreted, which begs the question to... Why do we even do this? Like, especially in America, where everybody speaks English, right? What's the What's the benefit of 
of Chuck speaking in tongues, Larry interpreting what I need to hear if he could just tell me what what he needs to say in English. Exactly. You know, why do we need to go through that unless we lived in a multicultural community where there exactly, is a yeah. lot of different people Probably speaking. Probably explain well, I've never heard it, right? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that's why I, in Jerusalem, there is a multicultural area. There's a lot of Europe is multicultural, yeah. and there's a lot of languages. A here lot in of America. Southern, uh, southern uh, Louisiana is. <laughs> well, yeah, you <laughs> could have the issue there. You could go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not like, occasion <laughs> by you. Yeah, it's, it's just funny talk. But um, so that's where I'm thinking in English, we, we don't. And, you know, what's the, the, the purpose of it? People say, well, to glorify God, it's to show that God is here. That's not working for me because it's, there's a menu. It's, yeah. it's to increase the power of your prayers. Increase the well. Okay, hey, hey, we're not so, talking about that. Right well, now. We're gonna next week. We're gonna we're gonna you know, hold on yeah. till next week because next week we're gonna continue this and we're gonna get into the fruit and what is the fruit of the spirit with tongues and is this you know what we're seeing today with tongues is that really what we should be seeking. And uh, we're going to talk about that next week. So hold on for part two for next week. The Mike Charleston Show. History with Larry. All right. All right. This is uh, the next history time. I got to say, I like that intro music. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I think that's my favorite. It does. (laughs) (laughs) All right. What's the chances that I'll know what this is? What are you doing? I don't doing? know, because, yeah, maybe. I, this is a tough one. I, think you, one. I think you might know. But I'm going with 50-50. Oh, 50-50. Okay. So, so here's where we're going to start. Okay. Have you ever heard of a movement in which the leader was a self-proclaimed prophet? Uh, many. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. And which the Holy Spirit gave him new revelation. Oh, boy. Well, that yeah. kind of goes part and parcel. Or a leader that said he was the embodiment of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're Oregon. narrowing it down a little bit, but yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. And that he was sent by Jesus. Well, that's usually yeah. the case. And his leader, his followers also claimed that they had new revelation and that their revelation was on par or above Scripture. Money! <laughs> well, I don't know if that's the money, but... <laughs> Um, sound familiar? But it's starting to sound like Bethel, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, now let me add a little bit more to it. Okay. And that they're, the followers themselves said that they were above ordinary Christians because they were filled with the Spirit. And okay. they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, this, so far you're not narrowing it down very much. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I'm still Larry. All right. And by and this group would also go into these trances and yep. speak in unintelligible okay, once words. Again, we're, we're still talking like most churches in America here. I got something to say. Uh, yeah. All, and also the, this movement claimed that they would help purify the church and Get the world oh. ready for the coming of Christ. Are we talking about the Quakers? No. The Puritans? No. Uh, but does it sound familiar? Well, it sounds like a lot of things, sure. It does, but it shouldn't, because this is from the second century B.C. Oh. Oh. This was this a movement. Is oracle? That's so oh, an M? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I read it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Montanists? The Montanists, yes. Ah, uh, the Montanists. The Montanists was a movement based on the man, Montanus. Montana sounds it, like a cool yeah, name. M O N T A N U S. Oh, I mean, is that if, what Montana's named after? Uh, maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Montanus himself was a former priest in a cult called an Asiatic cult called CB. C Y. Oh, they, they built houses during the war. <laughs> no, those were the CBs. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this was C Y B E L E. Sebel. Sebel. Okay. I'm not sure how you spell say it, but sure. Something like that. Cebu. No, because no O. Yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> he was also accompanied by two women who claimed to be prophetess uh, as well. Why Priscilla not? Priscilla and Maximilla. Oh. Yeah. So. Maximilla was a woman? Yeah. Okay. I guess that wasn't Maximus? No. Okay. I, she was part of his team, I guess. The, mm-hmm. the three of them mm-hmm. led this movement and they, uh, yeah, they claimed to have new revelation and that their revelations were above scripture. Oh. And There's that the, no way. Yeah, yeah. there absolutely was a way. 
and that the church was supposed to accept this revelation as if it was from God himself. Okay, and, so this is before the Catholic Church. This yeah. is before the, all the, the councils of Trent and yeah. all this stuff. So, yeah. okay. And the wow. church was like, I don't think so. Right. Mm. They, Yeah, they uh, basically condemned him as mm-hmm. a heretic and... Did they kill him? No, they oh, didn't. Okay. Uh, but they did excommunicate they? him. The church leaders okay, at the time like in, the, in Asia Minor, Turkey, Minor, Minor. <laughs> Minor. I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, like Pliny and 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 all those early church fathers. Is that what we're talking right. about? Well, actually, Tertullian. Tertullian. He actually followed Montanus. He was one of his followers. Was that Tertullian's not actually. One that I would put on the good side, but okay. But yeah. Right. So, yeah, he was sense. one of his followers. Mm. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Tertullian. Who do, why don't we name our kids Tertullian anymore? I don't know. It's kind of weird. But mm. but the interesting thing is it sounds like something from today, in that, yeah. but this was from the second century. Same, wow. same so stuff. So, what you're saying different. is it's been around for a long time. It's been around for a long oh. time. I went with this because it kind of would go with the theme of the show this sure. week. And so... So sure. what you're Something. saying is history repeats itself. It does. And mm. the other thing is it's interesting that Jesus warned that there'd be wolves in sheep's clothing coming. Right, sure. Yeah. Paul warned that there would be grievous wolves coming. Grievous wolves. And then Peter also warned that there would be people that would come into the church and make merchandise yeah. of yeah. God's people. And it's it's like, when are we going to wake up as a church and realize, oh, yeah, it's happening? Mm. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was a group, and actually, the Montanists actually gained popularity, and there, some historians believe it finally died out around the ninth century completely. Oh, wow. So it lasted a good while. Uh, it lasted a long time, and yeah. it covered a large area, and it was a heavy influence on the church at, at large, and mm-hmm. at that time, and they, uh, but they had some other thing, like, like I just said, the biggest thing was their prophecy. Mm. Um, the church at the time, of course, they were looking at sign gifts and things and because everything was new for the most part. But they when he would go into these trances and start uttering things mm-hmm. and then he would have this word of knowledge and that was his prophecy. And of course they didn't come true. <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> details, right? Right. And the church leaders at the time they rejected it because they said, well, nowhere in the scripture did any of the prophets of God act like this? Mm. And that was one of the bases. And the fact that they were saying that Jesus was going to come back and set up his kingdom That's in always the part of it, right? city of Phoenix? Phrygia. Oh. Phrygia? Phrygia? Maybe. It starts okay. with a P. P-H. Y. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, of course, over there in Turkey. Yeah, somewhere okay. over there. And, you, of course, we know that that happened. Oh, well, well, yeah. <laughs> Just like Jesus came back with the Jehovah Witnesses. Oh, right, yeah. And, came uh, back in spirit. Right, yeah. exactly. So, that was a, a movement. And I just thought that would be fitting, like I said, for today's movement. Yeah. Sure. That's a one that I hadn't heard of until I started studying this The Montanist. Yeah, the Montanist. Yeah. And yeah, there's a lot of those little little groups that some legit, some not as legit. Because uh, obviously around the third century when Christianity became more... Um, I didn't. I don't want to say commercialized, but more formal, right. and it became more legitimate and more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Catholic. Institutionalized, yeah. Organized. Well, because Catholicism came soon after that, right? But when Catholicism took over, it it took over everything, yeah, and it was it really hard for any every, anything to like step up. But there was always little groups, right, throughout yeah. the Donatists and the. Uh, I guess the Montanists. Mon- yeah, they were still around when in the Catholic Church formed, but. Right. That actually was the thing that kind of, I guess, in a sense, finished them off. Yeah. That formality of the Catholic Church. Sure. I mean, the Catholic Church is strong, man. It was. But yeah, that was another movement. That's a topic for another day. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. But yeah, Montanus and his two cohorts, Priscilla and Maximilla. Maximilla. Yeah. All right. The Mike Charleston Show. Music with Sarah. What song do you like? All right, babe. The, your song of the week. Uh, some people really like this segment. And uh, so, anyway, so. you were asking me as I was getting ready, have I ever heard of Bob Fitz? And I was like, of course I've heard of Bob Fitz. He's only been around since the 80s. And you're like, who is he? And I'm like, he was a worship leader. I can't tell you of all the songs that he wrote. Well, 
this week's song is one that he wrote. It is. It's um, You Are So Faithful. You Are So Faithful, the one that I think that kind of sounds like a Mentos commercial. What? Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. just, it's, I don't know. It, it sounds like it could fit into a Mentos commercial. But anyway, it's, okay. it's so 80s. It sounds so 80s. It is very 80s. And I don't know that I've actually heard Bob Fitz sing it. The right. one that I, I know is on the album called You Are So Faithful by right. Maranatha. And um, so I'm not sure who sings it on there. I think it's Lenny LeBlanc. I probably just ruined it for anyone. Now they're all going to go listen to it and be like, yep, sounds like Mentos. <laughs> I know. That's and if you terrible. know what Mentos is, it's time to get your colon checked. So. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it's, it's an old thing. So if you're that old, it's, oh, it's okay. time to go see your doctor. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anyway, the song is You Are So Faithful, and as the title says, it's about the faithfulness of God. Yes. And I think there's so many aspects of God that we can be reminded of in singing, and this is one that talks about His faithfulness, yeah. and He is so faithful in it. The, the verse talks about the sun that rises every day. We don't tell the sun to rise, but every day mm -hmm. the sun comes up, um, right. like the rain, like the breath, like all these things that we can point to that just keep happening and keep happening and yeah. keep happening. It's like, that's God. Like he's, he is faithful. He's there for us. He'll forgive us even when we are unfaithful, even when we don't follow him and we don't heed his, you know, promptings or whatever. It's like he's faithful. He still loves us. And so it's just a great reminder of that. It is an old song. It is a very old song. I think but, everybody you know. should know it because I think but it's this beautiful. Is the point is to point to back to some songs that maybe people missed or we got a whole generation that thinks they have created music, you know, and, and they don't realize that there was things before them. And I'm like, hey, there are some good songs uh, back in the day. And yeah. this one you like to play often. And it's just not my type of, like this song just, like I said, it reminds me of an old Mentos Sorry. commercial and uh, I can't help that. But the words and stuff are still fine. Right. Well, and then it, in the chorus, it says, in the midst of the storm, through the wind and the waves, you'll still be faithful. And to, you know, I think so many of us, we go through things in life and we go through trials, we go through hard yep. times and to just be reminded that God's faithful even when things get hard. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, how can you disagree with that? You can't. Yeah, so go check it out. It is, it's Bob Fitz or, or it's Lenny LeBlanc. We're not sure, yeah. but Bob Fitz actually wrote it. But it's it's the, from the album "You Are So Faithful" from Praise Band. It, we don't know if that's a compilation or it's yeah. like we said, this is old. So we're lucky that it's on the internet. So <laughs> you you can go find it somewhere. It's not that old. It's it's from I, the eighties. Okay, it is. It but is uh, anyway, go go check it out on um, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your music, and and you, you are so faithful. It's actually the name of the album. Yeah. So anyway, all right. The Mike Charleston Show. M -m 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 Marriage. All right, babe. This is the marriage moment, right? Or whatever we call this now. And actually, you picked up a book from the library. I don't know the name of the book. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. But uh, you were reading the book, and in the chapter, there's a chapter in there that you were asking me about these things, and so I had a hard time guessing. Yeah, so I, the title of the chapter had a word, and it said this word, and then a colon, and it said the arch enemy of every marriage. The arch enemy of every marriage. So my first guess was selfishness. Yeah, which I would agree, selfishness yeah. would be up there. But the... Um, the, besides selfishness, you were we were talking about the uh, what else could it be? Because I got the wrong answer, and so I'm like going through bitter bitterness. I heard you say "b," and you're like bitter. Uh, it does start with a B, and I was like bitterness, and she was like no, and I was like um, I don't know. We were we were going down the list of all these Bs, and I could not get it until finally. Uh, you kind of mentioned led me... kind of anxiety, which doesn't start with a B, but you're talking about being anxious, worry. Right. And I was like, oh, you're getting close, like stress. Right. So... And I'm getting anxious now just thinking about it. <laughs> so, anyways, what is the B word that they what, that they said was the arch enemy of marriage? Busyness. Busyness. So, in fact, I'm like, okay. That's fair. I still think selfishness is right up there, but it could be one of these issues that we just don't talk about. And, and so when you when you go meet someone mm -hmm. and you say, hey, how you doing? And, and instinctively, what does everybody say? I'm busy. I'm busy, man. You're you busy. just don't imagine how busy I am. And, and, the, and the funny thing is in this day and age with the, the, the culture that we have of and all the 
conveniences that we have, like you would think we would be not very busy. You would think that. Well, and I think when it comes to, like you say, selfishness, which I think obviously is a huge problem in any marriage, but selfishness comes across when you think about it. I mean, like it seems sinful. It seems wrong. It's like, oh yeah, I'm just thinking of myself. Whereas busyness kind of creeps into all of our lives in America and it, it's not a sinful thing. It's like, I'm going, I'm doing, I'm going, I'm doing, I'm going, I'm doing. But, we feel like we're doing something. Right. right. And it can be even good things, but the th- the devil will use anything to attack your marriage and to try to draw you away from each other. And so we just get to a place where we're just in and out and going from here and there and whatever. And so it's going to eventually affect our marriage. And I think it absolutely does. Well, no, especially when you have kids, the these this day and age, uh, I don't know about a hundred years ago, but this day and age, it's kids' activities are many. Yeah. And they're all over the place. Right. And I wish it would stop so that traffic would go down a little bit <laughs> when I'm coming home. But uh, but no, it's like we have activities for every kid doing everything. And uh, whether it's at school or if it's at uh, somewhere else, you know, they've, they've got lessons here. They got after school projects here or they, they're on a team or something like that. They've got right. athletics. That will drive you crazy going all over the place. And yes, you will be busy driving around, stuck yeah. in traffic, and uh, right. maybe not as bad as I was the other day in an hour going not even a quarter mile <laughs> in an hour. <laughs> but it, it'll drive you crazy. But yeah, supposedly it corrupts your conversation because you're just so busy. And I was like, yeah. how does it corrupt your conversation? And I was thinking about that. I'm like, well, because we're so busy, I'm like, I can't talk to you right now. I'm busy. Yeah. And uh, depletes your love life. I'm like, well, if you don't really spend time together and you're busy, well, Pretty guess much. what? I mean, when you rush and everything's just rushed and like, okay, let's quick do this. Let's quick go here. Let's quick whatever. It's Easy. It's going to affect things. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, what about it steals your fun? You know, obviously because you're just so busy. But I, I was thinking if you're so busy, take a break. Just take a deep breath and think, re-examine your life. Kind of like what we talked about just a couple weeks ago or, you know, last week. You know, what's the purpose of what we're doing? And so relationships are, it should be number one in our lives. Obviously, a relationship with God. And then our relationship with our family and our wives, our husbands, our spouses, our families, our friends, our neighbors. You know, these are important relationships to have. And if we're just so caught up uh, doing other things. So I'm spending time at work. I'm so busy with work for making a living for another man, you know, or whatever, yeah. and spending my time doing this so I can get this report in for what, you know, like yeah. we reevaluate our life, man. If you're too busy to talk to your wife or kids, you're too busy. Yeah. Well, you're just way too busy. Well, that's the question I think we all have to ask. Busy doing what? Right. You know, what are you doing and why, you know, because I what think... What is like busy? I would think like like we were talking about, I, I know I hate to harp on this, but like 100, 150 years ago when the ladies had to go down to the river and do the laundry, you know, and, yeah. and go outside and kill the chicken and then pluck it, then cook it, you know, and say, what's for dinner? It's out in the backyard. And yeah. like we could just stop by the Raising Canes and it's already ready for... We could we complain if it takes five minutes, Yeah. you know, and, and so yet it should make our lives easier. And yet it doesn't and makes our lives even busier. And I, I don't understand why. Yeah. We just need to learn to say no to some things. And like, we just need to learn to chill. Yeah. Just take a chill pill a little just bit. Just slow down. Stop yes. and consider what you're doing and why you're doing it. And realize that you need to slow down for the sake of your marriage. Yeah, I mean, that's why I like living down south. I think I was destined to be down south. Because <laughs> I'm that type of guy that will sit on the porch with these old ladies and uh, drink uh, tea. Uh, for about an hour and a half and let them tell them their whole story and I'll listen to them. But down south, we do take a little bit of time. And yeah. uh, I, there are times where I'm like, eh, I got to go. <laughs> you know, I am a little busy, but it, it is like, I get it. We are busy. This We are, live in a busy culture. But if we don't reevaluate those things and say, take time out for our spouse, specifically, since this is the marriage moment, not family moment necessarily, yeah. but you could in, incorporate that with your family. And like I said, if you're not, if you're too busy for your wife, for for kids or your your husband or whomever, your spouse, and you're, you're too, too busy. busy. You you yeah. got to stop. And so that was an interesting title. It got us our attention. So we wanted to just talk about it a little bit. And and like if you're too busy, take a chill pill and take a break and go spend some time. And they actually had a report. They did, they did in the in the chapter there, the percentage of people that spend quality time. And what was one of the stats they had for spending time? Well, saying husbands and wives spend like 
it was in the 20 percentile that spend an hour or less a day. An hour together. or less. Now, that was just spending time together, but you said good quality conversation. Good quality conversation. There's another study that says couples on average spend three minutes a day of meaningful three conversation. Three minutes a day. Not talking about, are you picking the kids up from soccer practice? Are you picking, are you going to the, right. we're talking about meaningful conversation. Three minutes a day. If that is you, change right now. Yeah, yeah. Go home, look at your spouse in the eye and say, we need to talk for at least five minutes. <laughs> Start right there. and uh, But no, seriously, three minutes a day, come on. Yeah, that's pathetic. So yeah, and, uh, and, how, and just spending time with each other. So in each other's presence, if we can't do that an hour a day, like what are we doing? Well, we wonder why marriages are having problems. And when you read a stat like that, yep. you don't wonder anymore. No, no. So. We, we have more meaningful conversations with our boss or our coworkers than we do our spouse. That's a problem. Yeah. That's a real problem. So anyway, take a chill pill, relax a little bit and talk to your spouse. Spend some time with them. Don't be so busy for your family. Hey, this is Joshua Charleston, the producer of The Mike Charleston Show. Thank you for listening to the show. If you want to follow us, we're on Facebook at Mike Charleston Show and Instagram at underscore Mike Charleston Show. Please support us on Patreon for exclusive content. This episode is over, but if you want more, check out the website at fellowshipofbelievers.org for more information. The Mike Charleston Show has been brought to you by Fellowship Believers.